Welcome to Dr. Fred Bell's Health Science and Energy Show once again. The tutorial. Tonight we're going to have uh, a tutorial tape played later on for the Rays of Truth Crystals of Light. Because some of you have bought the book and never heard the tape, so you'll get this is your chance to hear it. So anyhow, we're going to continue on. Uh, September 26, 2010. We're continuing on with last week. Remember, I always rewind it back about a half a minute. So. So it will repeat itself of, a little bit. Uh, you know, making a position or an observation of where we are with our universe. Even though man is, in fact, the universe, the universe, in fact, is of man. And there is a tremendous correlation between the two. The earth should be treated just like a baby. It should be nurtured and respected, and then the earth will give feedback in life. But we have a failure to do that. Now, the next thing that happens is the earth and the sun... I'm sorry, the earth and the moon go around the sun. This takes about a year, about 365 days. During this time, we have four seasons. So what happens is we go around and we have four different seasons. We have a growing period and a mating period in the spring, which you can see how animals and people behave. You can see a summer cycle, and you can see a winter cycle, a period of rest, and then the beginning, the new building again. Spring cycle starts again, the fall, autumn, all those things. Now what happens is we have another cycle. This is called the precession of the equinoxes. This is a greater cycle where we go around a still another sun, up in the Pleiades. It talks about it in the Bible. We've heard about the sweet influence of the Pleiades, all of these different biblical tests attest to that. And what happens is this takes 25,827.5 years, this rotation, right? Now what happens is we have 12,500 years approximately of darkness and we have 12,500 years of light. We're now coming out of a period of renaissance or darkness into a period of light. When, in fact, we go through this cycle, it then makes it possible for the consciousness within our atoms to become illuminated. And we, in turn, become illuminated. And as you can see in the last hundred years, our science spreads, our spiritual energy starts to spread, build, and grow. And we go through, of course, a, a period of stupidity like we're going through now before we come into a millennium of golden existence. But right now, we've got to realize that we're coming through this period of stupidity, okay? And ignorance is predominant now more than truth. During this time, there are sub-cycles of 2,500 years, and they are given ages. Aquarian age, Piscean age, Taurian age, Aryan age, all of these kinds of things. These ages talk about the seasoning of consciousness, the seasoning of human actions. And once during this revolutionary period, when we reach the migratory part, the absolute peak, approximately 144,000 souls leave this solar system and move out into space and go out and go into the heavens, into other celestial places. And when this period takes place, the ones that stay behind, which are called the recorders, you know, there's many different names. The Egyptians had names for them. The scribes, they called them. They then, in stone or other manners, like in Tibet, they do it on all old papyruses, record these events, and great record-keeping begins to take place. For example, when the libraries of Alexandria were burned, the White Brotherhood came in and removed certain records, which were then moved back to Tibet. On Easter Island... Things were recorded. Eric von Donegan made a tremendous study of this. And when you begin to see the specter of the beauty and existence and joy of life on a tremendous, on a heavenly level, on a celestial level, then you really begin to understand what's going on here now. Now, our bodies at this point in time are trying to evolve because to be able, as we move out into this higher realm of light, we begin to get the influence of other stars, okay? The influence causes, for example, hormonal changes to begin to change their entire characteristical patterns in the body. For example, first we are minerals. Our body is 5% minerals, right? The minerals then require enzymes for assimilation. Enzymes deal with what's called pH, potential hydrogen, the pH factor. When the pH factor is balanced, the minerals move into enzymes and then go on in, and we have vitamin assimilation. The vitamins become predominant in the body. Vitamins polarize light to the right 
or to the left. Primarily in human beings, to the left. That's where the word lava comes from, lava rotary. In Laetrile, for example, that term was coined. Then what happens is the vitamins with the light polarized split in two different directions, the energy fields, and produce a left and right mirror of amino acids, which then reflect upon consciousness producing hormones as we know them. As we evolve in consciousness, and we don't do things like we do to block this growth of hormone structure in our body, what happens is the hormones allow us to go into what's called higher consciousness or the altered state. Some people today will demonstrate that because they have been able to put this balance together to maintain this balance. And that's why we have life extension. That's why we have people like Sai Baba doing what he does. That's why Yuri Geller can do what he does. That's why other people, you know, walk on the, the hot coals like Vernon Craig. And there's a million little things that are nothing more than teasing demonstrations to demonstrate, in fact, there is a higher dynamic working within all of us that if we allow it to, it will automatically release this higher consciousness. Science fiction, in fact, becomes science fact. That's why we're seeing today Wonder Woman, Superman, and all these kinds of things. So what we have done in health energy sciences and paradigm before that is we have developed technologies whereby we can allow our bodies to grow ahead without the interference of electronic smog, air pollution, like right now I'm sure you're breathing 2,000 different chemicals in this very room. You've probably eaten so much poison, the water in Pasadena is the worst ever. I've never seen such bad water. And on and on and on. And this has a negating effect on the body. Okay? So a few years ago, Kurt Donsbach came to me and he asked me to develop something that was better than the pyramid. He says, you know, the pyramid is great. I believe in it. But it's the most ridiculous thing to most people when you wear it. It freaks people out because they don't understand it, you know. Religions look at it as some kind of satanic tool. Other people look at it as, an, as, a, as a nuisance. When they bend over, it falls off. So he says, develop something that will work on the body radionically that won't harm you or offend people. So that's how the receptor came about. So what we did is we took a design. First of all, we had to take a collecting dish because everywhere in this room right now, there is microwave radiation. And that comes into your bodies. And the first thing it does is it destroys the pH factor of your body, the potential hydrogen factor. Because if you look at the atomic level, for example, if we look at a hydrogen atom, we have a proton here, we have an electron right here. It goes around approximately what's called the speed of light. Okay? Energy moves in constantly from another dimension. Okay? It moves in. This is called the Niels Bohr effect. It's called quantum mechanics and physics. It comes in in the green spectrum and moves towards red in the center of the atom and violet in the outside of the atom. The entire study of radionics is the science whereby equipment is built to address this receiving part of the atom at this exact point. Radionic equipment will tune up the receptivity of an atom towards the red or towards the violet depending on whether a person is suffering in a particular color band of frequencies, okay? Red and white here, red, green, blue, and down violet and brown in the center. That's the way our bodies work. So we ha if we have problems somewhere in the body, we can immediately go to the zone of the body and look at the color factor that's there, radionically then make the adjustments. Then what happens is homeopathic medicine comes in next. Homeopathic medicine is very simple. We look at... Before we become a cell, we're first, once again, we're atoms, right? At the moment that the atom becomes a molecule, and a molecule is the smallest form of energy having a chem chemical characteristic. At that exact moment is when homeopathic medicine goes to work because all of the uh, atoms in the body, all of the cells in the body, have a small mineral content because minerals are reflecting light down into lower frequencies to form mitochondrion and all the other kinds of things that are inside of a cell. So homeopathic works with radionics. Radionics sets up the environment and directs it, and the homeopathic remedy then manifests. And you can see other booths out here with electroacupuncture machines, computer control now, with different little wells and samples for witnesses that radi with the homeopathic treatments work in. Okay? So this is another area of science that I work with. 
Upstairs in room 302, you'll see our laser shows. A laser is quite interesting in the fact that it works, once again, right in this region. Because if you study how a plant, for example, behaves, a plant likes to take white sunlight. It takes the white sunlight and separates it immediately into the green. It absorbs the green out into the magnesium atom in the center of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the blood of plants. It also becomes the blood of man. Chlorophyll and hemoglobin are almost the same, with the exception that hemoglobin, the red blood cell in man, has an iron atom in its center, where chlorophyll has a magnesium atom in its center. If you look at the geometry of a magnesium atom, it is a three-sided pyramid or a tetrahedron. If you look at an iron atom, it is a four-sided pyramid or an octahedron. Okay? So this is where now shape, nature's shape, begins to make the determination of how we utilize this green light coming in. Then man eats the plant, right? Man eats the plant, digests the plant, and forms ATP inside the cells. Then man, through the Krebs cycle, takes this green energy from the sunlight and separates it into sugar molecules, five carbon atom sugar molecules, which then gives the cell energy to continue the reflective action of the minerals. Okay? So you begin to see now how the body works. This, at this point, we're addressing what's called the pH, or potential hydrogen factor within the body. Okay? We're looking directly at this. A laser, what a laser does, it's very simple. A laser has inside of it a white light source like the sun. A white light source has all color energies in it. The white light source flashes inside of a laser emitting and absorbing the green energy. Then what happens is the green energy that is absorbed from the white light, just like the photosynthesis of the sun, then emits one of seven different colors depending on how the laser is tuned and what gas is in it. So what happens is when you use the laser in your room or in your homes in the healing aspect, you are getting the direct benefit of one of those colors and it will work into, the, into your body. The next thing that we do is we develop receptor type devices or devices that will take and make it more possible to e easily metabolize this coherent light and use it within our cellular structure. And that's what the scanners and the other things that we've developed are all about. So you begin to see how all this stuff, when we talk about holistic health, it's starting to get exciting now. We're coming up on the edge of something really exciting. So what we did in the receptor, going back to the receptor, is we had to address the pH factor in the body first with microwave energy, right? Realize we're getting bombarded. So what we did is we chose the pyramid shape the four-sided pyramid, not a three-sided pyramid, because we weren't building these for animals or plants. We were designing these for human beings. And so we put 144 of these little pyramids inside what's called a concave dish. Okay? A concave dish is a dish that is slightly spherical, but not totally. And what that does is it will take energy or radiations coming from any angle at any point in time and reflect those energies down on these pyramid filters that are sitting in 144 different locations. Now, the next thing we had to do is we had to process that energy. We had to make it conform to the human growth cycle. This is where we get into the study of mathematics called Fibonacci, or phi series. For example, if you look at a pine cone or a rose, you will see two petals and then another ring of three. Then you'll see two plus three in the third ring, five. And then in the fourth ring, you'll see three plus five, eight, and so on. This mathematically builds up in a snail, a rose, a pine cone, or anything that's living. So we did the same thing. We arranged these little traps, these little processing pyramids, in what is known as a Fibonacci ring. This then meant that it, the, the antenna system itself was broad spectrum at this point, could receive any form of energy that had any kind of transformation factor, and then it would always, because it was like this, was acting like a lens. It would receive in, anywhere outwardly, but it would only center itself in a focal point in the center. So we, had, we built a bridge. We found the focal point, and we built a bridge. And then what we did is we now wanted to refine this energy. We had it in the right vibratory frequency now, but it wasn't refined. 
Companies like IBM were at this point getting involved with these kinds of projects. One was called the Squid Project, the Maser Amplifier, which was we used in radio telescopes at this point was doing the same thing. So it wasn't like we were doing something unique. Several other firms several years ago had been developing on similar types of devices, but you probably never heard about them unless you were reading Scientific American or you were abreast of science. So what we did now is we did something the ancients did. We put a gemstone, one of seven different gems, located at this point, and that became like a diode. So you can go out and you'll see diodes out there. This acts as a diode. Different gemstones now will filter all of this energy into one frequency. The frequency of the green, for example, is that of the emerald, and it goes to the thyroid gland. So then what happens, we focus the energy back through a small hole in the back of the device. Well, that's uh, 16 minutes. I think that was the end of that particular tape. So now what we'll do is we'll um, put that one away. We heard the other part last week. We'll put the uh, tutorial tape for Rays of Truth Crystals of Light on. I think you'll like this one. A lot of you didn't get tapes with the book. So now here's your chance to hear the whole thing. Right, Dr. Bell? I'm sure you'll be coming Hello up. there. There we are. This is Dr. Fred Bell, author of Rays of Truth, Crystals of Light, available through Medicine Bear Publication. Obviously, you have reached Chapter 22 and 23. It's available through Paradigm now. It starts on page 181 and continues through page 195, and are ready now for the sound tutorial on Pleiadian sound and consciousness raising. This one-hour dissertation... It's part of a Pyridine tape series, which includes this tape, as well as 17 other hours of chalk-filled fun information for all. It goes into greater depth than the book itself, and because it's a live voice, it's easier sometimes to listen to a tape in your car than it is to read a book. The two sort of go hand in hand. The tape series is available through Medicine Bear Publications or through my company, Pyridine. Paradigm has a website, which is www.paradigm.com. We can be reached by phone by calling 1-949-499-2603 or 1-800-729-2603. As you probably have already read, sound goes back to the beginning of time with the word Om, Om, Om. So we know that the basic chant started it all off, including creation. And the Pleiadian ships, as I mentioned in my book, are sound powered, light separated. So sound is very key. Sound also affects our DNA structure, the aging process, our clarity of mind from day to day, and our ability to sleep or not sleep. This is called sound pollution when it becomes polluting, such as sounds from jets, garbage trucks early in the morning clanking their containers around, sirens, crowd noise, ambulances, helicopter sounds, all these sounds are very hard on the body over a 24 hour time period. Whereas, if you're up in the mountains listening to the wind blow through the trees, listening to a gentle brook flow by, going to a waterfall or by the seashore, this has a healing, calming effect on the body and you can bet you're going to sleep much better with these sounds going on in the background than the negative ones. And over a 24-hour time period, seven days a week, 365 days a year, this will have a positive or negative effect on your body. For this reason, we have created musical tapes to remove the sound pollution from your body. Our first tape is an album called The Fellowship the Sound. Fellowship the Sound is based on an actual recorded Pleiadian ship with synthesizers that coincide and work through and wrap the sound around the ship, creating a, what I call, detoxing effect on all cells and DNA in the body. When you hear some of the songs on the fellowship, at first, they may sound a little bit intense. This is because there is an intensity built up inside of your body in your cellular system. If you hear the songs repeatedly over and over again over a period of time when it's convenient, you'll find these songs become friendly, not so tense, and you'll start to relax more, and actually some people say they space out. I actually have to warn you, if you're driving a car listening to the Fellowship album, 
You'd better listen to it at home first because you might get too relaxed. Our next album was called Atlantis Rising. Here we used a lot of sounds of the sea, including actual recorded sounds of dolphins and whales. The next album that we did was called Galactic Meditation. Galactic Meditation was recorded with a friend of mine in Germany named Werner Aaron, and we used 19 different Japanese bowls, special synthesizer sounds, a Pleiadian ship, and all of these things were tuned to different what are called planetary sounds, like a certain sound and certain chord structure would come from Saturn, Jupiter, Uranus, Neptune, etc. And so when you go into the meditation, which is further on in the book, I recommend the Galactic Meditation album. The next album we did was called Higher Ground with Stephen Halpern. We used a sound of Gaia, a 6 to 8 hertz background sound, which is the sound of the Earth itself. And this is very great for listening to all night long while you're sleeping. It's available at Tower Records or your local record store. Our newest album will come out right at the millennium. It's entitled From Andromeda with Love, with an all-celebrity band, Voyager, featuring George Winston, playing Hawaiian flat key guitar instead of piano. Guess what? Yours truly played the piano on this one. Anyway, enough rhetoric. Let's get started and watch out for that Pleiadian ship. take the carbon atom and realize that relationship with the Great Pyramid and its geometric proportion being the same, only smaller, and remember that shape and size, as long as the shape is related mathematically by pi and phi, which we talked about earlier, you realize that the Great Pyramid and the carbon atom are going to resonate together. What are they going to resonate to, you might ask? Very simple. The relationship to the carbon atoms in the Earth, which realize the earth is carbon based as are we as are the pyramid and the entire structure of the earth the carbon atom and the great pyramid are going to resonate to their location and position in space and time and so it just happens that at this point in space and time we are going into the Aquarian age which is the doorway to the fourth dimension now a lot of us are Piscean tuned we have the Aquarian awareness but we don't have the consciousness yet and one of the purposes of the Paradigm product line and the things that I do and some of the other New Age people do is to enlighten consciousness by a means of technology as did the ancients long time before us. A lot of people say, well, I could just get into a spaceship, fly away, that would be fine. I realize it's a technology, but why just can't I go home and sit down in the chair and make my body into a spaceship and fly away? Well, some people can do that. Most of us can't, including a lot of extraterrestrials who rely on an external means of transportation. But at the same time, there's a thing called acclimation. If your body is not used to or ready for this great change and you're jumping into an extraterrestrial spaceship, you're able to come back after your voyage quite disoriented. And if you come back disoriented, like a lot of contactees have and a lot of abductees have, it's hard to readjust to this life back here on Earth. And a lot of people go crazy, like in the Benny and Barney Hill example, for example. Uh, Betty survived the ordeal, but Barney didn't. He had elders before it happened, and he died a few years later after the experience. He never did adjust to it. And it's a positive experience sometimes, even though they were picked up by the civilization called the Graves. The Graves did not severely mistreat them at that time. They just sort of indoctrinated them into the ways of what they were about. When I worked in the NASA facilities and I worked with Rockwell I was working adjacent to a program of space medicine and space medicine was a program whereby the astronauts were conditioned to go into space a lot of the astronauts uh, had a tr trouble for example staying in their bodies because they were highly powered athletes and 99% of your energy is overcoming gravity on every single day and when you put yourself out in space for two weeks with not a bit of gravity and you have a powerful athletic body, as does an astronaut, your energy's got to go somewhere, your consciousness's got to go somewhere, 
unless you're severely, uh, you know, uh, anchored into your physical body, as they were not, most of them, you're going to have an out-of-body experience. And even if you don't have an out-of-body experience, you're going to have a higher vision of vision of a higher susceptibility to seeing extraterrestrial vehicles in space, more so than if you were not in space. I'm sure a lot of times you've heard of people looking up in the air and some people seeing a spaceship or an extraterrestrial device or a UFO and others can't see it and they're all looking at the same direction at the same point in time. It's because consciousness cannot is not is not sensitive yet, sensitized yet. I'll give you an example. Right now, in the room that you're sitting in listening to this tape, I want you to look around the room and look at everything in the room that's brown. Take a a couple of seconds here and look around, see all the brown things that you see in the room. Now I want you to close your eyes, take a deep breath, like that, and say, wait, I want to remember all the things I saw that are green. Now remember that, or blue. Now try to remember all of those things. Now open your eyes up look around and suddenly things that are green and blue you have a sensitivity to. It's the same thing with what I'm talking about now, getting ready to get ready for this higher space consciousness, which is important for all of us to realize. I'm sure most people out there would like to have some kind of a spiritual experience. Some of you want to become contactees, some of you probably want to make a big trip, some of you want to maybe build a spaceship, some of you want to use this technology for healing purposes. I'm sure there's a thousand different uses that people have and motivations to listen to this kind of material that we're presenting now and to go through this experience. This material is unique, as I've said before, in the fact that the music, for example, that we used up to the point that Scott Wolf came back on was what you would normally hear in a tape series. It was, it, in a better tape series, it would probably have something that would be subliminal. Then when Scott came on, for example, we started bringing in the sitar and other instruments that are more powerful, with more timber. And we brought the consciousness up to another level. And now we're coming into the next phase of it, which is the sound phase and the meditation phase. We're going to bring the level of consciousness up still even further. And the reason we're doing this is because at this very mo moment, we're moving at a thousand miles an hour along the surface of the earth versus the air. And we're moving several thousands of miles an hour through the sun around the Pleiades. And the Pleiades, of course, is moving with the, uh, with the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is moving with something else. So you have this grand scale of motion going on continuously with many different concurring cycles. And what we're going to do by the end of this tape series is be tuned in to this uh, series of cycles. We've had to open the chakras up from the very, from the very hard chromatic, pragmatic, for example, the grounding that was necessary in the beginning of the tape series where we talked in depth about the great government cover-ups and the aliens, good and bad aliens, and all these kinds of things which the ego had to hear those things to really to relate to where we are now. Where we are now is only the beginning of where we're going to go. That's the fun of holographic sound. And holographic sound in itself, people say, well, what is that? I said, well, the, the, the Andromeda is teaching me holographic sound. Oh, is that some form of new microphone? No, you can use any microphone with holographic sound because what holographic sound is all about is triggering one series of events to another series of events by the timber and not the cord, but the cord, of course, has to go first. You might say that in the beginning, so far, we were playing chords like a chord on a piano, but pretty soon we went further than the chords on a piano and we went into the sitar, and pretty soon we're going to go into the Palladian ship. Now, that is to say that I haven't laced this entire um, tape with the sounds of Palladian ships because we have. And that's a lot of fun to listen to them, but as you hear the Pleiadian ship more and more and more times through this tape series, you're going to detect diff more and more deeper things in the consciousness of hearing the sound of the ship. As we go into sound, we go into the meditation, you're going to feel more and more and more. And pretty soon you're going to hear that sound of that Pleiadian ship, and it's going to be second nature to you. It's not any longer going to be, oh, what was that, like when you first heard it with the wave sounds at the very beginning of the series. You're going to start identifying with it. You're going to start feeling something from it. And when you start doing that, automatically you're going to connect subconsciously and consciously to the Pleiadian vibratory frequency. This is going to draw you more towards the society of Pleiadians because your aura field is going to start opening up to it. Blockages are going to be removed. These kinds of things happen. Then when we get into the system and you start applying things like our Fire Star Aura along with special design tapes and sounds that go with these kinds of devices, what happens is 
you're going to be really launching yourself out. Just about every single individual that has installed a Firestar orb, for example, has had some kind of an extraterrestrial experience, whether it be a sighting or a direct contact. And there's not, I can't think of one that hasn't been uh, installed somewhere in the world that somebody has not had a major spiritual experience from. I give all this credit to the Pleiadians and the higher forms. I take no credit. I was just taking directions from a, a Pleiadian cosmonaut and religiously trying to understand what she told me to construct this type of device. But now getting back into the sound, we're going to have to, first of all, go over and listen to a piano. Now I'm playing an A chord now, down to an A minor. And when we play something like an A chord, we're talking to a chakra in the body, just a straight chord. Now the piano doesn't have the timber, in, the timber element in it as does, say, a sitar or a Pleiadian spaceship or something that sounds similar to a Pleiadian spaceship developed from the same harmonic context. context. So if you look at the body starting with the head and go all the way down to the base of the spine, what you'll find is a series of chakras or energy points. Now on the receptor we talked about tuning up for a gemstone, say a ruby for the pituitary or an emerald for the throat or a um, sapphire for the heart. Imagine what would happen if you were to add the proper sound to the receptor so that you would wear your receptor, for example, which is tuned to a particular chakra vibration. At the same time, you would hear a sound. Now, when we talk about hearing a sound, if you play A, for example, which is the A again, the A tunes into the pineal gland in the body or the area of the highest head chakra within the body. Now, you can get up into the crown chakra, something else. But we're talking about the seven basic notes, A, B, C, D, E, G, F, E, and what happens is with these basic seven notes, we're going to get different responses. If we go down into the next power level, or the next energy field, which is the note B, which would sound something a little bit different than A, it goes down a little bit further into the body than does the note A, it's a little bit different sound. And then if we go down into C, we're getting a little bit more down into the throat. And so on down the whole spectrum of the body. This is something interesting to note. Now I'm going back to the piano again for a moment. And remember, the very first part of this tape series, up to the time that Scott Wolf was, came on, the second time, we were using, here's for example, an F or some note beyond that. The basic sound is fun, and you can take a piano and play it as Mozart did and get some very, very strong sounds and some very moving medleys out of it, but it takes a lot of work. Now, the next thing that came along that happened was we got into the era of electronic music, and the first changes in electronic music allowed us to take the piano and add a little bit of timber to it. Now, it wasn't the answer, but now look what happens when we play an A chord with a little bit of timber on it. It's a little bit moving, it's a little bit deeper, and I don't have to increase the tempo of the, the note progressions and chord changes to bring out some kind of a sound to get some mood going. Just the, ver the sound itself makes the mood. And then what happens is if you go beyond the mood, just the sound itself, and start actually playing the piano, what happens is then, with this kind of a power, with a little bit of melody, you start getting... A you start getting some real power moving there hearing it and feeling it, and it becomes a whole other uh, synopsis. 
Then we can go into some of the other synthesizer piano settings, for example, the bell and string combination where we add the violins. starts to take on even another dimension. Now you say, well, whatever happened to the old trumpet sound? Trumpets and instruments like that, because I'm a clarinet player, and I have a lot of respect for these instruments. As a matter of fact, I'll never give up clarinet playing. As I'm starting to play it again. As a matter of fact, I'm in the process of looking for a new clarinet now. I started playing in the sixth grade. That's what finally got me into music. And to hear sounds like that, and maybe two trumpets together... It's quite gorgeous. But the trumpet, once again, it, it's, a, it's a sounding instrument. Remember, they played uh, like coronets and, and, and uh, bugles going into battle, for example, these kinds of things. And as a result of that, it's a simple instrument, but when tied to a whole lot of other instruments, it gives a good feeling. But today's times, this is wonderful, and I'm not putting this down, being a, I also played guitar, being an orthodox instrument player, it's wonderful. But still, there's something about the Pleiadian ship sound that just never ceases to amaze me and causes me to really want to have more and more and more of that energy around me. So, as a result of that, we've gotten into the laboratories, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard our albums, and you probably like, well, most people seem to like the sounds. Now, sometimes when you first hear our music, it's a little different, and it's a little bit hard to adjust to, meaning that uh, it's different, and you say you sort of like it, but you're not sure... You're not quite sure what kind of music it is. You've never heard it before. Well, that's fine because you have blockages. And after you hear the music a little bit more and a little bit more, especially the Fellowship album, that's a good, uh, what I would call, icebreaker for this type of sound. Once you listen to the Fellowship album two or three times, it becomes habit-forming. And it's not a bad habit in the fact that it clears you out and it relaxes you and gets rid of different kinds of stress. I remember when my dear friend Steve Halpern first came out with the frantic alternative music for that particular time, it was the very beginning of New Age. And New Age music is still finding its way into the hearts of many people, and a lot of people are turning to New Age now because the stuff that you hear on the radio every day really doesn't take you anywhere. It's repetitive. It sounds good in bars, and I suppose it works good on drugs, but on a normal person that's trying to excel in something, the music today on the radio, is, you know, for the broadest part, sounds terrible. And that's why a lot of the top uh, ten overall nationwide uh, sounds are the older bands that are coming back into to focus again because they had a, a stronger message. Look at the Moody Blues, for example, the band that I toured with for a long time as a friend. They uh, have a tremendously powerful sound even now. And this type of music that we're introducing is like when Roy Orbison started or um, Willie Nelson started. He had a new, they all had a new style of music. Even Elvis had a new style of music. And for a long time, for the first three or four years, people couldn't make sure whether they really liked it or not, but they finally decided they liked it, it had staying power. Whereas a lot of this new music that you hear today instantly goes on and gets a lot of promotion. People hear it a lot. It sells because people are hearing it. There's nothing else to buy. And then finally, when the reality of what the real musical message is sinks in, <laughs> it goes right off the chart. The record companies today are dearly struggling because they don't understand what they're doing anymore because they concentrated on money and profits and they forgot about consciousness. And today people are seeking consciousness and that's why the music is, this music is so full of consciousness. And this is what I have learned from the Pleiadians and that's why we use their sound techniques a lot in all of our music. Even the rock and roll album that we're currently working on now, which will probably be coming out soon after this tape series is out, called Freedom, uses the, this concept. And this music, by the way, we don't consider our music to be new age. We consider our music to be four-dimensional. We play concerts live a lot of times, the band Voyager. And I might explain and talk briefly about Voyager. Voyager is a band made up of different members of other bands that you've heard of. We've got members of the Yes Band uh, working with us. We've got members from the Grateful Dead working with us. We've got different people from different large groups, small groups. What we're looking for my, primarily is talent. And each band member from the larger band that comes in to help out Voyager, which is kind of a band that's there to put consciousness together, makes a contribution to that particular album. 
So we might have one musician from one band on one album and another musician from another band on another album because it's not about getting out the album. It's about bringing out, uh, bringing in an individual artist and letting him explore his talents to the fullest. When the artist can explore his talents to the fullest, then he can realize his potential. And if you look at the music scene now in successful music, a lot of bands are doing that. A lot of different uh, major, like Phil Collins, he does a lot of solo things. He does things with his band. And you look at uh, Paul McCartney, he has a band. He does things solo, does things with other people. The Traveling Wilburys is another example of a bunch of very talented musicians that have gotten together to express a mutual energy, a mutual feeling. So music is finally starting to get real. And these are the kinds of sounds and bands and combinations that will survive. Now I want to do is get into timber a little bit, and I'm going to pick a sound here that's very close to the sound of a Pleiadian ship as far as timber goes. Now the instrument I'm about to use here is a Roland D50 linear arithmetic synthesizer. It, because it's so rich in timber, or it has the capability of being rich in timber, not all the sounds it makes are rich in timber, it makes it an ideal device to use to work on chakra opening and transcendental meditation techniques that we use in mass audiences. Whenever we go out and play concerts in our seminars, live concerts, if I'm just playing a solo concert and I only bring one synthesizer, you can bet this is the one that I will bring because it has the most power for this particular aspect of what we're doing. Now, there are other synthesizers in front of me that all have aspects, but this has what you would call the root vibration or the root energy field in it. And from this part of the tape series on, you're going to hear this synthesizer and this sound a lot. Now, when we did analysis of Pleiadian ships, we found, with a spectrum analyzer, we found that there was a 1,000 cycle main frequency and several sub-cycles underneath it. Some of the cycles that we found in there were cycles of the musical notes, especially lots of G's and D's, which we'll get into in a minute, and also a very large frequency of timber frequencies that extended down into the blood pressure or blood circulatory frequencies, the heart frequencies, and the frequencies that we found in the Palladian ships were harmonious to the human body, oftentimes a bit intense, however, to the uneducated body, meaning that they had to have their chakras blown out or destroyed before they could understand the sound. What, that's why we're trying to um, gradually unwind the negativity and disharmony in your chakra system with this tape series and allow you to be able to stand the tremendous power of the Pleiadian ship. Because when you reach it towards the speed of light, the energy field goes up, the size of the density goes down, the concentration goes up, um, and the uh, um, material density, of course, goes down when the concentration goes up in energy. And what happens is you pop over to the next dimension, the next plane, and the, and the atoms in the body have to be able to do that, especially the hydrogen atom. So anyway, now we're going to take a look at this heavier sound here, and this might be a familiar sound. But I'm going to move this sound around a little bit as I play it. And this, this sound, by the way, was one sound. You won't be able to find the sound anywhere because it's a sound that I created with a special use of a Atari computer and a system of matching up the different parameters of the ship versus the parameters of the synthesizer. And it takes literally hundreds of hours, even with the proper computer setup, to do and uh, create these sounds. And I create these sounds, and once I have the basic sound, then I can build actual families or banks off these sounds, which I've done. And that's when I'll start using multiple synthesizers here in a minute to show you what happens when we start stacking these sounds, all with fourth dimensional timber characteristics. <laughs> chakras I just stayed in the D and G so we're just kind of kind of going into the solar plexus of the body if you remember what I told you about earlier the A being the top of the body and the um, 
Gino being at the bottom of the body. So we're playing around the base of the spine, which is the logical place to play around at this point in time with this kind of an experiment, because we're just introducing you now to these kinds of sounds. Now, when I talk about A being at the top of the head and G at the base of the spine, I don't want you to think that this is happening all the time. Realize that sound has to enter somewhere in the body. I mean, the sound just isn't hovering down there and just jumps on the body. It doesn't work that way. It goes into the cells first. Cells grouped in the frequency of G at the base of the spine. The, through these cells, naturally, if you go back, it has to go into the molecules. If it goes into the molecules, it has to go into the atoms. And if it goes into the atoms, we have to look at the four basic atoms that we're addressing with this sound. Yes, believe it or not, an atom is sensitive to sound. It doesn't have to be your ear or what you feel. It's actually the atom itself. So what happens is, in the case of the atoms we're looking at, we're talking about the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen atom is the most sensitive to sound. The music of the sphere. Remember I talked about it earlier in the tape. The hydrogen atom, uh, through the enzyme action, when the enzyme is, is, is close to the right frequency of the body, in vibratory rhythm, what happens is the hydrogen atom allows the energy to enter the body. The body, of course, receives the energy as the motation and rotation and frequency of motion and rotation of the hydrogen atom. In the morning, when I, as you remember, when the sun comes up, I said that the uh, energy coming from the astral plane going down into the hydrogen atom enters through the center of the hydrogen atom and the first part of the, look at it, like a rainbow there. And this rainbow then goes down to the nucleus of the hydrogen atom and the other end of the rainbow, which should be violet, goes out to the um, electron, the outer uh, parameter uh, revolving particle because the hydrogen atom is nothing more than a proton and an electron and so this rainbow energy is just animating this and the color of the center frequency of the rainbow is green and later on when we go into the meditation we're going to go actually into the hydrogen atom and have the experience but right now we're just feeling it we're breaking you in slowly so that when we do the meditation and that meditation you can use it long after this tape series has been uh, listen to in its complexities and its completeness you can always go back to certain tapes and use them over and over and over again with your system if you want or to share with your friends so now what we're going to do is we're going to vibrate the hydrogen atom in the body now realize that as the sun moves in the sky or the earth rotates the hydrogen atom is changing polarity that means that the music is changing its polarity remember I said it you know in the sunset when the sun goes down now the violet part of the energy field, the light that's animating the hydrogen atom is going to be towards the nucleus, the proton, and the uh, red energy is going to be out to the electron. It's it made a 180 degree phase change. The only thing that's changed consistent is green, which of course is nature. Nature is a green energy field, or the thought process. The thought process rotates 180 degrees. That's why you think differently in the morning than you do at the middle of the night. And that's why if you move from L.A. to Germany in 10 minutes or two or three hours, it takes you a long time to adjust to the climatic change, the geomet uh, geometric climatic change, because the hydrogen atom has to repolarize. And this is called, called, of course, jet lag. Sometimes you have music lag. So right now, I, at this point in time, I, this is the evening. This is being recorded right now around 9 o'clock. And so naturally, the frequencies in the body are going to respond. The notes are going to respond different. If there's one thing about getting up in the morning, you can always count on A being uh, at the very base of the, at the, or at the very head, and uh, G being at the base of the spine in the morning. This is the way it is. And during the day, of course, it's changed. And that's, it's like it's a master reset button on a computer or something, you know, if something gets jammed up at one of my synthesizers, I push the master reset button to, or unplug it and turn it back on again. It sets all circuits to zero. Same thing with your bodies. When you get up in the morning, usually you feel somewhat it's the purest that you're going to be at that point in the day unless you have a tremendous hangover and if you have a tremendous hangover your, your alignment to your musical sounds versus your body might be off because your body hasn't caught up with itself yet so anyway now we're going in to explore this uh, we're just playing D and G chords here for a minute we're going to explore this a little bit we're going to go a little bit deeper with the sound now and see what it does to you so you might just close your eyes and take a deep breath and listen to this <laughs>
I'm sure that did a little bit more than the other because we did a few other things. Not only did we add some very powerful root chakra sounds in with great tremendous timber, but we also bent their frequencies down to the next note spectrum below it. So we swept the whole chakra system. And when we sweep the whole chakra system and we bend these notes with note bending techniques, what happens is you end up sweeping out the entire body, cleaning the entire body out. Now we'll show you what happens when you make an actual music sound with a synthesizer using this. We'll, we'll put something together where you actually hear music from it using these sounds. <laughs> level of the sound, and that is to stack more of these same synthesizers together using harmonic characteristics of the same sound, but with different timber characteristics. So the harmonies are going to be the same, the notes are going to be the same, but the timbers are going to be different. They're going to be higher, more refined, lower, and more coarse. And we're going to show you an entire sweep of the chakras, and at the same time we're going to sweep the timber frequencies through the chakras. families of timbers from other synthesizers to take the timber deeper and deeper and deeper into the body until at some point we're going to cross into the fourth dimensional. So at least the atoms will be vibrating on the fourth dimension. Now to get the visuals going, I suggest fire breathing or a lot of times we'll use the laser and the uh, crystal technique where we put the laser right on the crystal, which I'll talk about later. Remember, you can always come back to these sounds and this is just the basics. Now this first technique that I'm showing you, we demonstrated on our fellowship uh, album. In the journey part one, we used a lot of this type of stuff. Also, I found as a musician, or I should say musician student, because some of the people that I'm uh, seeing from time to time in my career that are musicians are just blow me away, like uh, my friend Patrick Moraz from the Mooney Blues or John Anderson or some of these people. They're incredible musicians. They've dedicated their entire life to it, 100%. And when you put these tools in their hands, you should hear what comes out of the sounds of the music that they make. But anyway, on our fellowship album, I found that one of the things that was happening to me, I was going through a personal transformation myself, and I'd worn the pyramids. Remember I explained to you earlier about the changes, and we had this one example where a lady by the name of Jay-Z Knight started wearing the pyramid, and she wore the pyramid for a period of time, and, and uh, her hormone structure changed. She started channeling Ramtha, and... and we brought a whole new level of education on that level of the Ramtha level or the warrior level, the deep spiritual warrior to the earth. So I found that by using the pyramid, opening myself up to the channeling energies and letting myself go in that energy, uh, I was able to channel different musicians. And it was an interesting thing. On uh, Journey Part 1, if you listen in the background, you'll hear a Jim Morrison sound and uh, coming out of one of my synthesizers, which I didn't even know was aware it would make that sound. It sounds like his entire band with him playing guitar 
and I try to duplicate that technique that I used the night that I recorded it, and I just happened to be in the right rhythm that night to channel his energies, and I was thinking about him when I played, but I was never able to channel him again to that degree, and so as a result, I never could play that sound, that song live in concert when we went on one of our concert tours. In the second album, we use another technique, which I'll get into momentarily, but first let's demonstrate the first technique where we stack sounds and timbers and augment the hydrogen atom into the fourth dimension. Now, of course, in the morning, when you, if you were listening to this tape in the morning, you're going to get a certain feeling from it, for these sounds, and I guarantee you, if you try it in the evening, you'll get another set of feelings, and if you try it at midnight, you're going to get another set of feelings from it, because it's going to trigger different energy centers in the body, even though the notes are the same. Now, this is the one synthesizer that we were using before. I'm going to add one more. going up to upper C. Now I'm going to add one more synthesizer. Now I've got two going now. Tempers are different. Let's do the difference. Now you can really hear the difference up here between that and that. It's a fuller, richer, deeper sound with a second synthesizer when we get up to upper C. It wasn't as noticeable in the beginning on the lower note. Now I'm going to add a third synthesizer. how deep it goes now. It can almost hear other instruments that aren't even present at this point. quickly when you add it. Now I'm going to add what I would call a, another sound that's a slightly different family, but it still comes from this distant, we call this sound distant, by the way, this distant family. And you're going to hear uh, the ring up and beyond, er, beyond everything else. And the reason it sounds like it's up and above and beyond everything else that you've heard so far is because it, it will open up your consciousness to a deeper level of meditation, deeper level of understanding within the human form, the God consciousness within the body, and you're going to respond to that. Now, when I add this family, I'm going to turn it up. So once you hear the note, I'm not going to change notes for a second until I bring this other sound up, and then you're going to hear it come up. You'll see what I'm talking about. It'll add a depth to the, the whole sensation. We'll have to continue this um, next week because we run out of time here. It's only a one-hour show, now so we'll there. stop we'll it right ahead. there. And so we'll continue this next week. And if you copy this thing and get the books out, you'll... Um, you have a great tape here to listen to when you get the whole thing together. So we'll see you next week, Thursday at 5.